Hello and welcome everyone. It is Thursday, November 17th. Uh, thank you all for joining our community call this week. We're going to start off with some quick housekeeping and then pass it off to Chris, from, uh, who's the CEO of Block Science Labs, uh, to talk about uh, smart papers and some of the work they've been doing with Minotaur on a specific uh, joint smart paper there. I'm really excited to, to get into that. Uh, but yeah, first going over some general community updates. I will quickly mention and remind just with the holiday schedule coming up, uh, at least with Thanksgiving in the States next week, uh, we will not be having either our weekly internal PPP meeting uh, or our community call next week. So that will be canceled. Uh, and then uh, most likely the back half of December, uh, the 22nd and the 29th, those two, at least those two community calls towards the end of the month, uh, next month will be canceled as well. Uh, does anyone have any other community activities? Paul, do you want to mention the TAPTIP program or anything? Yeah. Read my mind. Yeah, so just a reminder that uh, November 25th is the deadline for signing up for our newest writing cohort, which is focusing on the SCURF interviews podcast uh, in particular, um, some block science stuff, right? So uh, this writing cohort will be focused on the recaps and extracting value from that podcast. And so if you're looking for an opportunity to uh, hold yourself accountable to deeply engage with a pretty cool podcast series, uh, also uh, looking to get some feedback on your own writing as you kind of think through Web3 and Web3 research and the intersections between those things, uh, this is the cohort for you. And I will drop a link to that in the chat here, uh, but you can also find it in our uh, community on Discord, and then we are working on putting that on a banner on the forum as well. And I know that Discovery is pushing that out as well. So looking forward to having people join into the current cohort. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. And very relevant to that. Yvonne, did you want to jump in? Yes. Uh, speaking of the podcast, the latest episode is out. So <clears throat> it is a discussion of computational science in Web3 with Danilo Bernardinelli and Jeff Emmett from Box Science, and I will drop the link in the chat. And Danila has a really interesting background in kind of physics and modeling uh, and computation and bringing some of that to uh, governance oriented work, which is super interesting. Um, yeah, anyone have any other uh, kind of SCURF community activities to make sure to highlight to the wider community? Seems like not. So if there is anything else, oh, Angel, please. Yeah, sorry. Um... If there's anyone new or you just want to meet some new people or are interested in learning more about SCURF, we have the onboarding boot camp happening tomorrow at, uh, I believe, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so hope to see some fresh faces there. Awesome. Thank you for that reminder, Angel. Yeah, excited for that one tomorrow. Um, perfect. And if anyone has anything else or if you have any non scurf community updates that you want to provide, please feel free to drop those in chat. If you have anything else going on that you think folks might be interested in, uh, please feel free to use the chat for that. Uh, but yeah, I uh, am excited to pass it off to uh, to Chris. Uh, and I guess as part of your introduction, if you also don't mind disambiguating block science from block science labs, because I know there might be some conflation, uh, that would also be very uh, helpful. But yeah, thank you, Chris, and passing it off to you. Yeah, not a problem. Uh uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, let me share my screen. And I'll jump into slideshow. Um, yes, so today we're going to talk about loss functions and then a project we're working on together to create a smart paper, and then we'll go into what smart papers are. But before we do that, let us introduce ourselves. So I'm Chris Frazier. I'm the CEO of Block Science Labs. We are a data science product company um, building out solutions that are based in the engineering principles of block science. So block science labs was incubated within block science, um, but block science is a research and development firm. Uh, they do engineering work, they do client work. And when we got the idea of productizing the methods that they, that they use in their work, we thought that it would be a good idea to create a separate entity that would really focus on scaling these solutions. And so that's that was what birthed the idea of Block Science Labs, and that's where I've been focusing. And I'm joined today by Andrew Clark, who also is involved with Block Science, but he has his own endeavor that I'll let him talk a little bit about. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I I have a kind of varied background, undergrad accounting, um, 
master's data science, worked as an, as an IT auditor and security auditor, um, and then from set up, like how would you audit ML and, and AI assurance systems, uh, worked with some governing bodies for making some some of the documentation and proper steps in the auditing world, uh, worked at Capital One setting up their program, um, came to Block Science and uh, worked on a lot of awesome systems modeling um, with them, and that's where I got to meet Chris. And then uh, recently, a couple of years ago, started a firm called Monitor, which is an AI auditing platform. Basically, how, what are the steps and what are the key things you need to get in place into making responsible ML deployed into production? How to get over from like the lab into um, into production? So that's the high level overview. Awesome, thank you. So uh, what we're going back in here. So what we're going to go over today is uh, something that uh, Andrew put together, um, loss functions, and he's going to talk about their application, uh, why it's important. And then he also will touch on some other things that are interesting in the world of AI governance. And then we'll switch back to me. And then I'm going to go over what exactly a smart paper is. And then I have some examples of some of our MVP products on smart papers. And then we can go into a Q&A. I wasn't sure if you guys generally jump in and ask questions, which I'm perfectly fine with, or if you want to save that toward the end, I leave that up to you, but I structured it just so there's a section at the end. But I'm going to then switch gears. I'll stop sharing and let uh, Andrew take over uh, to do loss functions. Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. And the caveat, we're using this as, a, as an example for um, how smart papers work. And it, currently, we're, we're transitioning over to that format. Um, there's This is nothing actually new here. This is just describing loss functions, but in the context of um, you know, how to make your models not be biased and how to um, deploy AI responsibly. Um, oftentimes, we get a lot of questions about you know, what is multi-objective optimization? What, what does that mean? What are the kind of, how does that work? So essentially what we're doing in this smart paper, which is the reason I reached out to, to Chris uh, about this is, the ability to have code with the text and the ability to have the plotting and the ability for, for users to kind of have that interactivity um, is, is this is a really great topic for that to help illustrate these points. As that's monitor, we try and bridge that gap between the, the non technical risk managers that need to understand when they say, What is a system doing? They want to know what was the inputs and how that gets to the output. They don't care about when they say, I want to understand it. That doesn't mean the same thing as, you know, SHAP values or data science explainability, feature importance, that kind of thing. They want to know high level what's happened. And then you, of course, you have the DS folks that have a, the struggle to understand the high level concepts. So what we're trying to do is just try and bridge those gaps. And this specific post, we have a whole series of, uh, of, of bias posts on like, how does bias get introduced into your models? And it, mostly it's a data problem and, and things like that. But this post is going to be very specific about okay, high level risk people, we're trying to bring you down a level and, and understand a little bit more what's happening under the scenes. So uh, essentially what, what we're talking about here for how, show of hands, is everybody pretty familiar with loss functions? Because I can, I can modify this presentation um, higher or lower scale. I think it would probably be good to to uh, assume a rudimentary knowledge as the average. I'm sure there are okay. some folks who have much deeper knowledge, but there are definitely going to be some who are, who might be hearing about it for the first time. And I'm sure those with deeper knowledge won't mind a bit of a refresher. So if you don't mind actually doing a few minutes on that, that would be really great. Perfect. Well, then I will just kind of talk to you at a, a high level of of what is actually the the text written here. And perfect. I, I won't spend too much time on the early stuff, but also definitely. Um, Refreshers are always good. I, going back to the principles for my, I always do it all the time whenever I'm reading something. So definitely, thanks for the feedback. So, <clears throat> a loss function in 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 theory is essentially what calculates the error between actual values and predicted values. And in machine learning or statistical modeling in general, we can really break down um, into two categories: classification models and regression models. Um, regression models means I'm predicting a continuous output. Uh, we have Monitor, we work a lot with insurance companies um, where they're predicting like loss values and things like um, based on, you know, weather conditions, driver's history, that kind of thing. We're going to predict what's the estimated loss per year for this individual. So then we can help price their, 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 their policy. So that would be a regression output where loss uh, score would be between, you know, zero, no loss and a hundred. This is going to be a high loss. Don't take this. That would be like a risk score for a loss. And then you have classification, the classic, you know, uh, cat dog type of image classifier, but also 
Um, a common example used in machine learning from Kaggle is the Titanic data set where you're predicting if someone died or survived. That's a classification model. So that you really have, a, these can be divided into different ways, but those are really the two bases for all modeling. Time series and, and statistical modeling often focuses on the regression. Um, machine learning is becoming uh, more useful in the classification types. So the loss function is really what function, how do we calculate the, uh, if we have a list when we're training any type of model, we have a list of, uh, of labeled data of this is the actual outcome. And then we can iterate over this model and train it based off of here's what we predict, here's what it actually is. Here's what we predict, here's what it actually is. And you try and minimize that error or difference between them over time. Um, so there's a, just a whole plethora of different loss functions for different use cases. We already said the difference of the classification and regression. Well, there's even time series where you have that, the, the lagged values over time if you think of stock market prices. Um, and it, the time series models often, often have that relationship. Um, machine learning models often don't have that temporal aspect. They compress into just very static looking at something. Have I seen this value before prediction? So their loss functions are essentially just calculating that error. And that can mean many different things for many different parts. But the key part about how do we train these models is how do we optimize them um, over time and how do we minimize whatever loss function we describe? We're going to walk through three separate loss functions here today. Um, the main way that we use this is called gradient descent. In gradient descent, we take uh, partial derivatives, everybody's favorite from, from college or high school. Uh, we're basically, we're trying to see this, the rate of change at a specific point in time. Um, so we can, we can figure out, are we going in the right direction or not? So uh, an example I like to use is if you have an individual that's up uh, in a high mountain in Colorado, for instance, then they're lost and visibility is really bad. They can't know, they don't know if they're, if they're walking up or down, they don't really know, uh, they can't see the visibility. It's just so um, hazy or something. So this uh, climber could use a variation of this gradient descent approach where they're looking for the steepest path that they can see. So they can look at like two feet in front of them. They can see either high or low. And for the sake of this argument, they can't tell the difference. So they start walking at the steepest area. Um, then every few steps, they, they you know have an altimeter on their on their watch or something. They can evaluate: Did I go up or did I go down? If you went up, then you change directions, and because you want to keep going down, you're going to iterate until you start going down. And then after a, a while, you're going to hit either hopefully not a, a bottom of a hole, or you're going to hit the bottom of the mountain by your this iterative approach with the different steepness and the different step size that you'll be evaluating. And um, we use hyperparameters to optimize, which is a parameter that's not actually actively being trained, to figure out um, how many steps, for instance, you would take between each evaluation point. And then how much you would, and that would be the epoch, essentially. And then how much you would um, uh, you would adjust. So say I, I, every time I adjust, I'm not quite right. How many degrees do I, change, uh, do I, do I turn? What's my correction rate? That would be your learning rate. So uh, does that does that make sense? Any any questions from here, or is everybody kind of tracking on what a loss function is and what uh, uh, gradient descent is? That was really helpful. If others do want to jump in with any concrete questions, please feel free to. Uh, and if there's enough interest within the community, we might reach out to potentially do some more deep dive into into loss functions in the future. If you're open to that. Definitely, yeah, yeah. This is a <laughs> this is an endless topic, so uh, it, it's basically the gauge of interest of everybody, for sure. Happy to go deeper if, if desired. Um, so, for sake sake of example here, we're going to take a very simple model. Simple, and I mean, all models. It's it's just just a scale, but linear regression, often but used as like a baseline model, is still very effective. Essentially, what a linear regression model is, is just a straight line. You know, you've everybody's seen like a, a scatter plot of values. And you're just fitting what's the best fit straight line. Um, if it's a temporal model where you have time as the x-axis, that's when you can use auto regression and time series models to be more accurate and can have some swiggly wigglies lines and things. And machine learning can you know, optimize for non-monotonic, meaning that it changes directions. But linear regression is just a straight line. So it's very easy math, easy to compute. The equation, um, the essentially how we talk about it, is the independent variable, you can have one to many. We're going to just use one, so it's simple linear regression. You could have multi, multiple linear regression. We're going to use one in, input variable, the independent variable. And we're predicting the dependent variable, which is um, like the, the y-axis. So essentially, 
in this very simple form, the it, it's y is is the outcome equals mx plus c. Um, x is the observation or observations. M is the slope of the line, and c is a constant term. So essentially, what we're doing is we're trying to when we're training a model, we're trying to figure out m and c because x is the actual data. Um, so there's many different ways we can write out this notation. We're going to use uh, matrix notation, as this is often used in machine learning. Um, it just essentially shows if you if you write it up like this, where this x is a matrix, essentially y equals each row. So you can think of this as row. Matrix not no notation is basically rows. Um, and then the the t transpose means in this case we only have one independent variable, with, but we could have multiples. Um, but we're keeping it simple for today. And then the constant. Um, and that's univariate, the other way we could say uh, what we're doing here. So we're going to, to create um, this example, we're going to use two common loss variables, loss functions, which are MSE and MAE. Walk through them a little bit, um, and then we'll be talking about multi-objective uh, optimization, because right now we're just talking about single objective optimization. These are two very common regression um, type loss functions. And again, you you know, if you were doing talk classification, there's other loss functions. Deep learning has other loss functions, a bunch, bunch of different things. Um, and time series has different loss functions. So what we're going to do is use a gamma distribution. It's a statistical distribution that looks pretty skewed. Like everybody's familiar with the normal bell curve. It's kind of a skewed distribution. Um, we're going to generate randomly. Um, we're going to use minimal libraries like plotting. I'm going to really invent a wheel for plotting. NumPy is matrix, um, you know, putting data in, in values like this. And then of course we need like exponential and square root. So we're, we're gonna try and keep this example bare minimum on for the key things. We're gonna try and do everything from scratch, but plotting, not the topic for today. Um, so we're generating a thousand samples for the Y. So how you can do these is you can know what the shape of the distribution you wanna be based on your each distribution, the scale, uh, which is like the magnitude of it. And then what's how many, um, uh, how many samples? So we're gonna do, a thousand. So I'm just doing for the y, which is the y-axis, which is the vertical. I'm I'm generating a thousand for the x. I'm I'm just shifting minus two for both shape and scale to the uh, x, just so I have different distributions of data. Now again, we're using just a plotting library here, just because um, for simplicity. But we have this distribution here. We have randomly generated data of y, and we have x. And what we're going to try and do is train this linear regression model using gradient descent based on two on two separate loss functions initially and see what is the best fit line here. And this data is not in a perfect like straight line. That's why I did this distribution the way I did. So it is a little messy. So again, this is probably not the best model. If we were using ML, it would probably be like a really squiggly line here. Auto regression model would be a little bit more like that. We're just doing a straight line for sake of illustration. But um, a mean squared error is is one of the most common loss functions specifically in regression and basically what that is and this is the notation here it's the average squared error between the actual dependent the the this value the one we're, we're predicting and the predicted y hat is is how we notate predicted value as we train we iterate over the we every every run every epoch we're going to be um calculating this value and then we're going to be seeing if it gets better or worse that's that learning rate and that checking to see if we're going up or down um so notation here of, so it's doing average so that means one over n essentially what that means sum all of the values because remember we talked here we have y1 y2 in this case we have a thousand values so this goes to y a thousand and then x we only have one value but x to a thousand right and then these are the, the variables we got to figure out um and then that's that's what this looks like. And this is in the math notation for it. And then, so now we need to solve this. Remember, so we need to get the partial derivatives so we know which direction we're going. And this is a differentiable equation. So we want to see those um, th those steepness, that gradient, essentially. So m is a constant, the, the slope term, and y is a, a scalar constant value. But uh, m is what's multiplied by x. So basically what we're doing here is this is the, the equation. And we, because, remember, what, how do we get y hat? Well, the the equation here is y equals mx plus c. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace y equals mx plus c in, in, in y hat here. So great, we got this going on. So now I'm going to take the partial derivatives with respect to m and c. So if I took a full derivative, I'd be taking this full thing as it is. That's a regular derivative. A partial means I'm taking it, I'm only pretending one of these exists. I'm only taking it with respect to m so that the c just slides away. Um, and in this, and we want to get something on the left side here, which is what we solved for. So when we solve the partial for m, we get this equation, 
when we solve the partial for c, we get this equation. So now um, this allows us to optimize and train over this. It's going to make more sense when I show the code. Um, so our hyperparameters, we're going to have a learning rate, um, which is how learning rate is, is how far we'll adjust each each run. And then we have epoch, which is how many times we run, how many different steepness checks we take. Um, so for starting values, we're going to set m to zero, c to zero, our learning rate. We're not going to change a lot each run where that's a very slow learning rate but you have to those are the high parameters that are set before that we have to figure out and this is the number of steps we're going to take before we check again and then apply that learning rate again plot we're just going to we're going to plot and then we're going to store each time we iterate through so we're going to run it through it 15 times which is the number of of uh of uh steps we take before we check we're only going to run 15 times you know if this was a high mountain we'd have to run this a lot of times but essentially we take this current predicted value which this is just going to be zero because we're multiplying x which is the the thousand different values but we're multiplying by zero so it's zero plus zero so this is zero and then um this is just another plotting plotting and then um we're calculating the actual mse which is going to be zero based off this value and then we have these derivatives we just assigned and we're calculating those we're then taking that learning rate and updating the we're, we're updating the two variables, the derivative of the m and the, and the c. And then, so basically we can see here over time what our initial values are and how they iterate. And then we actually, the first one was was not great, a very high error, then better. And then we actually already, based on this example, by epoch number three, we actually basically stayed the same. We iterate, we got slightly better. We kind of stayed the same. So if you can see the, the solid red, and that's what that sum that plotting code is, is our final best fit line. And then we started over here just by the default values, which was basically, you know, perpendicular, and then slid in there. And then uh, MAE is another common. Um, it's it's the difference on these two is the, the responsiveness to outliers. If you want to be more influenced by outlier values, you use the MSC. If you don't want to be as uh, because the difference is we're not squaring. So if you square, you know, an error will become larger. So MSC optimizes to be better when you have a lot of outliers and you don't and, and you want to make sure you're not going too far in either direction. MAE means you just want the best fit line, but you're not quite as concerned about outliers. So we take the absolute value instead of the squared value. So um, MAE isn't because we don't have a squared and, you know, with a derivative, you'll always take like the, the top value here, like two, and you bring that over and then you, you subtract it. So like there is not really those values to pull over. So we have to do something kind of funky here to differentiate uh, because it's not meaningful differentiate bill. So we have to basically do a plus one or, or, or a minus one. So it's not the best for, for a gradient descent approach, but it still works. So that's why we like to have things that are, are squared and, and cubed um, is better for, for doing differentiation. Um, and it's because we don't have a great way of differentiating and it's going to be a plus one minus one, we have to seriously increase our, our learning rate because it's not as responsive during the training cycle. So again, this, this is the same code. We just updated the MAE here, and we updated the logic here, the if or else. And then um, we actually use, if you look here, we use all 15 cycles. So it starts at an MAE of 100. And if you see the scales, they're not one-to-one -one scales because these are squared, they're going to be a lot higher. Um, and then we slowly iterate through to um, a nine value. So you, actually, you can see the difference here. This one's a lot better for, for illustrative purposes. So we start here with basically zero values and then we iterate up here until bam, we have our best fit line. And in a moment, we're gonna show the, let's see, uh, it comes in a second. Well, I'll just go ahead and show it here. You can see the best fit line of our MSE is in red and our MAE is in green. So the, they are different because it based on the responsiveness of the outliers. So this is any main questions here. This is the the main um, the two main functions. Uh, for example, here, and then we're going to get into this the root of the problem of when we talk about AI bias. Awesome. Well, hopefully, I haven't fully confused anybody yet, but I'll I'll keep rolling, and then want to make sure I give uh, Chris enough time to go through some smart papers specifically. Oh, there, there was, was a question. One. Just. Yeah, there was oh, one sorry, question on how are, uh, how are MSE yes. and MAE so close in value? With one being squared. Um, 
Well, they're act they're, so they're not very close in value in the in the absolute terms, right? They're pretty high, but the models are pretty close. And then this one was was here. The models are pretty close in value because you're still optimizing over the same data. So that's how when you get here, they're still relatively the same model. The slope is just different, and the constants constants very pretty similar. That's the constants the intercept. The slope is a little different. The slope is steeper on on the mean squared error because it's trying to be more responsive to these. So the, 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 the absolute measurement values are off, but the models are because this is pretty close in the linear regression sense. We don't have a lot of hyperparameters and things we're playing with here. This is basically the best fit line. So there are different approaches of getting to roughly the same conclusion. So that just means they're both well-functioning loss functions that, and this is the best fit line. So that's why they've ended up in the same ballpark. Is that helpful? Let's see, I'll come back to make sure I see. Perfect. Okay, great, Lance. Um, I'll make sure I come and check next time. Okay, so now we're going to go to multiple objectives. So this is a key area of research in um, in AI bias. Is like traditionally when we're building models, we want things to be as accurate as possible, right? We want to be the most performant. The problem is oftentimes when you're looking, especially when like mission critical, like if you're optimizing for cat dog, I don't really care. Um, but let's just roll with that example for a moment say that uh, your model starts realizing that, well, we have more black dogs than black cats. So I'm going to start actually looking at that versus the, the, the difference of the hair or the height. Well, that's bad. That, that means your model is turning into, uh, it might have some racist tendencies. We don't want that. So we want to make sure that our models are, are learning what they should be learning. For an insurance specific example, I don't want to be optimizing. We had a bunch of really horrific redlining type bad stuff going on in the US, which redlining essentially means that if you were in specific zip codes, you were in a bad neighborhood. And if you're in a bad neighborhood, we're going to give you bad credit. And then you're in this bad loop where you can never get out of it and get into a better financial position. And that's not fair. You need to, everybody needs to have equal opportunity, right? So you want to make sure that your models aren't optimizing on like, oh, historically loss, loss costs are higher because based on the zip code. That's not okay. You need to be looking at each individual, what is their driving record? I don't care where they live. What is their driving record? And if you live in a, a place with a ton of crazy weather, okay, well, you can take that back. But I want to make sure you're only taking weather and driving history. And that's what's driving loss. I don't want to know its ethnicity. Don't want to know that it's anything else. It's not like I don't want to know. It better not be. We have to prove that it is only using actual loss data, not inferring based off uh, a protected class. So that this is a huge problem when we're starting to look at these models because you just give a model, specifically a machine learning model, a bunch of data. And we're even seeing here, it's just optimizing based on the data it has. If my only objective is to make this thing as accurate as possible, well, the model is just going to stupidly latch onto zip code or something and, and optimize off a of zip code. Because, and that's that's where it can be biased and and bad things happen uh, when you're when you're doing that. So you want to do what can we possibly do to make that not happen? So this is where multi-objectives are a new thing. So essentially what we would do with a multi-objective loss function is we want to optimize for both accuracy, but in turn, we don't want to sacrifice fairness. So for instance, I want to make sure that I'm only looking at um, driving history and weather if I am determining uh, a, a rate for, for a car insurance, for instance. Um, those two things, the, like that's equal opportunity. If, if you happen to live in bad weather Alaska, well, I mean, everybody's insurance is going to be higher because it's very expensive, right? But it shouldn't be looking at any other factors. I don't, you, we should not be looking at, you know, your family history or your education status or no, we should not be looking at that. We should be looking at what actually is correct, is like unbiased and correct. So we want to put in an, a multiple objective. We want to put in another objective that we're optimizing for. We want to optimize to make sure that we're fair and non-biased against, against all protected classes. And then we want to make sure that the model is still performing. We don't want to just flip a coin. We want to have some, some loss uh, protection there. So in for sake of easy example today, what we're going to do, and there's that's a huge topic for another day, multi-objective modeling. But for today, I'm basically taking that in mean squared error model, and I'm adding a second objective. The value can't be higher than 120. Let's just pretend that 120, anything over 120 is, is, is biased against, uh, I don't know, Dalmatians. I'm just making something up for sake of illustration. We want to make sure that for some reason, 120 is a, is something we is not okay. It, there is reasons that we are not comfortable with this. It's not it's not fair and equitable. So, for sake of illustration, even though this is a corny example, we're going to show how you would. It makes everything more complicated because you have to now make a double problem. 
Um, but essentially, we, want, we, we have to evaluate all of our, we do the same parts we did, but we have to make sure that our outcome is, is not greater than 120. So we have to add, remember our, our initial mean squared error equation looked like this, our differentiable one. So it's pretty simple. But, and remember, MAE had some issues. But now we have that same thing has now gotten more complex because we're optimizing for two things. We now have to optimize everything for, for two things. Can't be greater than 120, our predictions. If it's greater than 120, we're going to put the value at 120. 120s are absolute top. So it's, it's more things to solve. It makes the computation harder, the optimization harder. But it, it, when we normally in like classification models and other parts, we'd be making sure that we're not optimizing for zip code or ethnicity or something like that. So now um, we start off at a very high loss and it actually takes a, a while to settle in, a lot slower than it did last time. But actually, and, and so the, as the model settles in here, it took a lot longer. Remember our first initial mean squared was very fast. Our MAE was slower. And now when we come at uh, this multi-objective training, it takes it's kind of in between the two and the slope is a little different. So when we compare all three models now, ironically, and I did not plan this when I was building this example, my um, multi-objective model, because it took the MSE, but then actually put a cap on it uh, of how of how high it could predict on the y-axis, actually made it the, and now I've compared everything with the same loss function. All of them have been compared with MSE just for sake of illustration. So it is one-to-one -one now. Our actual best fit line is the multi-objective, which is also analogous with sometimes when you make sure you do AI fair and responsibly, you actually will be surprised on it being better performant because it's not just using bad heuristics. But um, in general, we this is the big next part in machine learning that we need to get to is deploying models responsibly. And one of the key aspects of that is knowing how to, what is the definition in your industry or what should it be on what's fair and ethical and build that as another objective when you're training your model, not just to be accurate, make sure it's fair and ethical as well. Um, so hopefully this was a um, a helpful presentation and kind of illustrative and uh, tried to take a very complex set of topics and make it a little bit more understandable. So, um, but this is definitely a large <laughs> rabbit hole we can go down. Yeah, thank uh, you. Do you, just wanna, do you just want to quickly touch then on this slide and then I'll, I'll switch to smart papers? Uh, definitely. Well, multi objective of modeling is a big part of uh, of research, but it's actually because one of the main problems in a lot of these regulated industries, a lot of companies have done something called fairness to run awareness, which is financial services, insurance, the, the, all the industries that matter on making decisions about people. If I remove any protected class information, thus my model is inherently fair. That is not correct because there, there's correlations and, and covariates that still exist, specifically if you have zip code and proxies. Um, so oftentimes there's not data to do a multi-objective modeling, which is another issue completely. And that's legislation type stuff we got to fix. But the biggest areas, you can fix a lot of the issues by doing high level, um, you know, making sure you have good controls in place. If I build a model, Eugene's got to review it. And we have to have a, uh, a multi-disciplinary uh, diverse team to objectively verify the model before it goes to production and periodically. And like, you need to have all these multiple stakeholder reviews and like, there's lots of stuff to do there. Um, and the other big problem we have is even defining what is fair or ethical because your definition might be different than mine or might be different than Chris's. And doesn't mean any of us are wrong if we're all trying to do the right thing. That's another thing. A lot of times when there's biased models out there, it's not because the people building them are racist. It's because that they didn't understand some of the things, they have bad data, there's a lot of issues. So this is also, we need to approach this area in a non-judgmental, not like I'm, there are bad apples out there. I'm not trying to say they're not, but a lot of people working in this space really do care just because something might come out bad got to approach it in a productive way so people don't get defensive and really work on this, working with non-technical people and, and stakeholders on what does it, a good outcome look like and finding a way to enable that with technology. Um, and also, as we've talked about with this example here, there's there's a lot of current metrics in the in the field, like disparate impact and things that deal with classification models of what what is an OK ratio? Um, what what does it look like to be fair? There's not really anything out there for regression. So that's another huge open research area is what is, how do we compare the loss functions uh, or, or if we're predicting loss for like property casualty insurance, how do we compare those between for fair and ethical? So 
this is a huge area of research. We're just really getting started the past 10 years and making this uh, an area. So happy to talk offline more here, but um, hopefully this presentation is kind of open the eyes and there are things we can do, but things are complex and this is not an overnight fix. Awesome, thank you. So uh, Andrew went through uh, through a pretty complicated topic and um, the challenge there is that you may not have Andrew on speed dial to walk you through the loss function information. And so how can we increase the access to understanding what he's talking about and, and going through that example um, for a broader audience instead of having to be so technical? And that's where we got the idea of a smart paper. So basically a smart paper is a simulation enabled white paper where you're still presenting your analysis and results and the information that you need to share but you're, you're doing it in a way, if you think of it like it's a digital interactive museum. So if you're at a museum, you have exhibits where you can walk through each of the different sections, you can read the little plaques that tell you some information, but then you have these other exhibits where you actually get to touch things or you get to put something together, take it apart, really mess around with it. And those kind of interactive uh, exhibits really have your, your audience walk away with uh, some new learnings yeah, it, it, it's much easier for them to um, remember what they did because they physically interacted with it. So this is the idea behind a smart paper, where you take something like a traditional white paper or even a light paper, and you really turn it into this multimedia document that opens up to a larger audience while still allowing your more technical audience to dive in and get to the meat of what you're sharing. So that means it's combining a bunch of different things. You have your your mathematical equations, you have your descriptions of what's going on, you have your charts and examples. But beyond that, you can have an interactive widget that allows the user to define um, their initial conditions of a simulation, click go, and then they see an output. And they can then do that, and they can just change the parameters, see how it works. And that really expands on um, who can really get a better grasp of exactly the concepts you're trying to go through. So. Who is this for? So traditionally, white papers, it's a sales and marketing tool. Um, you're trying to get information out there, but you're doing it in a way because you, you're trying to convince somebody that you have something they want. And this is the this is the more technical details of why they would be interested. But it is a very narrow audience that's going to be able to grok the, the white paper. Um, so with the smart paper, like I said, you expand that audience. But I see this as also having a lot of other great uses. Um, for community involvement um, by expanding that audience if you're trying to if you're a, a young project and you're really trying to get that information out there if you put something out there that's interactive um, and you you offer up community interest because maybe you're trying to attract new talent to help you on the project or you're just trying to get the word out there um, using a smart paper would be a great way to um, expand the audience of who would be interested and get an understanding of what your project is um, I also see this as a, a way of changing how research and journalism is shared. Uh, it would be so much better if when you're expressing your opinions on, say, Twitter, you're doing it with something to reference and saying, hey, I actually have this little model you can play with, and this is the data that I'm coming up with. Um, not that everybody's going to go to that step, but uh, there are many uh, pieces of journalism where it's using current events and it has data, and it will give you some charts and you can really give the reader a more interactive experience with that article to get a deeper understanding of whatever the event is that you're that you're sharing with them by having an interactive widget that they can then play around with with the data. And then finally, I think that there's a big need for young projects to have a way of being verifiable and increase their legitimacy. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there seeking funding in the Web3 world. Um, and you, you could put your white paper out there. Some have just move toward a light paper to do a much lighter you know presentation of what they are but if you really want to be able to say hey this is a serious project uh we're designing this ecosystem we actually have a working model of that ecosystem and hey you can test our assumptions by playing around with the parameters of our ecosystem i think it dramatically increases the legitimacy of your project of showing you know you actually know uh what you're talking about and it's a real thing that you're trying to sell them on so we have a couple examples that I'd like to jump out of the presentation to show. Uh, so the first is um, our MVP. So I had built this very simple model that is um, 
it's based off the Grand Ethiopian Dam. It's just a, it's just basically a model of a hydroelectric dam that is looking at how greedy, depending on my level of greediness, how long would it take me to fill the reservoir behind the dam? And I built it in CAD CAD. And so I had this out there and I was just sharing the model and we decided to do an example smart paper on this where this then combines a lot of different elements. So on the first page of the, of it, you have a, a description and it gives you an idea of what those initial conditions are. So with the smart paper, it's using Markdown and it's combining in Jupyter Notebooks, but then it also has JavaScript widgets um, for the interactive pieces. So in this case, we have a code snippet so you can see the, um, the initial conditions of the CAD CAD model. Uh, if you go into the model, you can actually then see a lot more. So it goes in through the different aspects of the CAD CAD model. Um, to get a, you know, a, if you are able to read the Python code, it gives you then another understanding of, okay, well, this is how the, the model is structured. So now I can see how he's doing the update functions on uh, how he's, uh, how this is working. And here's the, you know, the static data that's going into it. Um, for background, there's also, uh, you know, this, this description of just what this is with, uh, you know, what the, what the history of the dam is, some images where it's located. So you really have this ability to really go through all your research what led to this. Uh, this is a high level description. This could be more like your light paper that's embedded in here. Um, but then you have the ability to have something that's more interactive. So in this case, what I'm allowing for the, is the user is to select their initial conditions. So if I just go ahead and run it as is, you'll see it's, it's, this is the uh, water that um, uh, is, is flowing through the Nile River. And then this is based on agree 30%. This is how long it would take me to fill that full reservoir. If I want to be more greedy, you'll see that it takes a lot less time. It hits that peak level much sooner on the time steps. But if I want to be less greedy, um, it takes much longer to fill the reservoir. So this was meant to be our MVP of really just showing the idea of combining different elements to be able to tell the story for different audiences. So then what we did is we took a block science model and did some enhancements to it. And that was on Uniswap. So similar idea where we have a bunch of the different elements of the Uniswap model, and then you have an interactive piece where there's this chart. Uh, this actually is gonna update uh, more than one chart, um, but this is really our second MVP on how this would work. Um, uh, no, we don't have the CAD CAD GUI available yet. That is something that we're working on with the new reference implementation that's coming out. Um, I think that's gonna be really cool with how they're restructuring everything, um, but yeah, that is, that is on the way. Um, so this has multiple charts that you can update and you click this and it will it'll update the charts here and down here and has some down here. So the, the, the point being here that it doesn't have to be just a single chart. You can have multiple charts that the, the user can interact with to, to play with the different concepts. But then this also go, takes it a step further where you can step through um, you know, actual pieces of the model as you know, separate pages. I, this is, you get the idea. Um, you can embed the notebooks. So this is the actual notebook embedding into it. And then there's additional resources which actually link to, it either takes you to a website or opens a PDF on your computer. So this, we took it a little bit further in adding some more elements. Um, on our official documentation, uh, we've embedded some videos, so you can also embed videos into your... Every day, he needs to make decisions, and they do not... So if you have explainer videos, if you have walkthroughs, if you have, say, community calls that are relevant, um, those can be embedded into it so that someone has basically a single point of reference for getting all the different information that's uh, that's relevant to what it is. And so we presented all of this, and we were able to sell this idea to Andrew, and he was very much, um, uh, you know, open to us working with him to say, okay, well, could we take some of your research that you're working with at Monitor and create a smart paper off of that? So we are. I just want to check. I saw plus one was that for, okay. Um, so we want to take on this challenge of can we take what Andrew just presented and expand the audience that could digest that information. And so this is our work in progress. Um, so we've we've posted that in here. And what we're doing is we have, you know, we're, we're rendering the markdown with everything. And what we're working on is then, how can we take this and present it in a way that then 
you don't have to be a uh, you know a statistical expert, machine learning expert to really understand to grok the concepts of it. So this is a work in progress, um, but we have it so that you can go through all the different um, uh, equations that he had walked us through just by clicking here. It'll switch it for you. Uh, we don't have the lines in, in here yet of uh, the the results, um, but this allows you then to step through it. So we're going to continue to develop on this because we're we're looking to make this a real polished final product that then um, we can present out there and saying this is our idea of smart papers and really to get feedback. We want to see if we can successfully uh, increase the audience of this topic through this multimedia document. And our eventual goal is then to, to figure out a way of how do we scale this? Because we want to make it so that um, you can really add in these kind of interactive charts in a DIY kind of way. Um, because this is really, this is mashing together, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, Markdown files, but it's also then mashing in, you know, HTML and JavaScript. So we don't want we don't want you to have to be able to go to web developers and just create you a new web page, um, kind of like if you've seen the augmented bonding curve that CommonStack put together. Um, they have that's a whole web page that they put together. It's a really cool thing. That was one of the visions that we had that we were going off of. Um, uh, we want to make it so that you know a, a larger audience of people can build that and build these things in a way that expands the audience of the concepts you're trying to share. So that is our yeah exactly thank you for sharing that eugene um so that is papers so uh any questions comments thoughts i really wanted to see what you guys thought of this get some feedback on where you think we're going with this yeah thank you chris so as folks have any questions please feel free to uh raise your virtual hand drop in chat. I will also just mention, uh, sorry, Lance, I missed your comment earlier. Andrew, if you don't mind dropping the link to the GitHub that you were showing in our chat, uh, Lance was asking for that if that's public. Uh, and Chris, someone who had to drop from the call early asked if, if it's OK to share any links to any of the smart papers drafted so far. Um, so yeah, just those things. And I can share appropriately to the folks who left. Uh, I'll answer first. So absolutely, uh, we've made uh, the way that we publish these. We make it so we can do it private or public. Um, the work we're doing with Andrew, we had as private right now, just because we were working with him on this, and we want his permission to then make it public. So as soon as he's okay with that, we're good. Um, uh, some of the other ones we've made public, so I will get those, and I'll get those to you, Eugene, so you can share it with the group. Thank you, Chris. Well, I was going to also kind of ask some of those questions because I'm going to guess that this. Uh, hopefully this rolls over into some additional conversation on our forum when this community call gets recapped uh, and people can join that conversation if you are watching this on a recording. Uh, but the, kind of the first kind of question that I was interested in is, I, I think this is very cool, um, and I'm kind of wondering like future states of these. Um, right, right now it seems like the author or the creator of the uh, paper is kind of defining what um, Kind of starting points of what the user's experience is. Is there an opportunity here in the future to maybe help uh, that this could become a more collaborative process? Um, I recognize that there's some technical limitations there, but I'm, I'm interested if that might be uh, something along your thought product pattern. Um, absolutely. So we built this in, in with the idea of it being a collaborative process. Um, I mean, that's that's the one of the visions of block science labs in general. So our platform. Um, is a collaborative environment uh, that um, we have a, an integration with, with Jupyter Hub. So you're able to launch Jupyter Hub, do your work. You could write the markdown, edit the markdown. Somebody else could be going in and you know creating those charts for the loss functions all within one place. And then you could be publishing those. Um, our platform already allows for that. And we built this in a way knowing that you know, a lot of times putting this kind of work together involves a team. It's not an individual. So uh, this supports team building, but it also allows for uh, uh, you know individual you know, building of this of this as well.
And I guess I, I was wondering, especially with something like the Uniswap paper, can you remind how much of that was uh, sort of via direct collaboration with Uniswap versus just kind of finding sort of how much room is there for non-primary authors to potentially spin up such papers on top of academic papers, say? I think the Uniswap example, Block Science just did that to, um, they created that as a representation of how their platform works. I don't think they collaborated directly with Uniswap on that one. Um, they've definitely done then uh, for other clients, they've created this kind of work, you know, in conjunction with the actual client. Um, but, uh, but I mean, yeah, so you could, like, say you wanted to do another one of the exchanges out there, um, you know, whatever the topic may be, it could be something that you're working with them on the research and creating this to help better explain concepts that um, can be used with their with their platforms. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm personally very interested in exploring and sort of why I really got excited when Chris and I caught up and, and he showed me the smart paper structure is uh, especially initially from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Chris, but the intention of these is not say to go to every academic on the planet and be like, stop that PDF thing, do smart papers now, um, and, and recognizing the reality of academic pressures and all that goes on there. But this can be sort of another communication layer on top of it to make it more approachable and interactable and thinking of what our mission is here at SCURP you know, having that layer to actually play around and get hands on and not just read a chart, but get to, you know, move around the features of the chart and get an intuitive sense of how the variables are actually interacting around this data. Um, that could actually be really powerful for discussion, learning, uh, and some of the other elements which, which feel uh, very core for us here at SCURF and our community. Uh, so hopefully some others kind of see uh, the relevance that at least came to mind when Chris and I chatted and are also uh, kind of getting some opportunities because, you know, I'm just imagining if on our forum, uh, in addition to some research summaries or whatnot, we had some of the features getting pulled in from what uh, you know, the Block Science Labs crew is building with these smart papers, how much more, you know, and genuinely, right, if someone does have immediate thoughts and feedback, I, I imagine Chris would be excited to hear of, you know, like, does this get you excited to actually want to interact and feel like you're getting more hands on with the research without needing to do like a full replication study or something like that? And absolutely. Um, our goal is not to replace uh, ways that things are being shared. Our goal is really to enhance them. Um, because if, if all I had access to was, um, you know, the, the actual paper, um, I may do other research on my own. I might jump over to YouTube and see if there's been any talks on the topic or do more research on the company's websites to really figure out some more. Um, this is really then taking all of that and putting it into one place so that the person can interact with all of it. So now that we've gotten all of that research into one location, then how do we make it so it's very easy to reproduce this? Um, so that anytime you want to then create your next paper, uh, it's very easy to uh, really connect all these pieces together and make a multimedia experience for the, for the audience. Absolutely. And I see that Renee dropped in chat uh, that, yeah, if y'all are looking for other kind of data sets uh, or primary research to build smart papers around, uh, Renee has uh, access to, and I'm assuming this is a, a, also a general talent doubt plug of there, there's a great community of uh, organizational psychologists and folks thinking about kind of future of work in the context of DAOs, and they have a bunch of great data and information there. So happy to, to link y'all after the call to make sure y'all can see any potential there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'll let you guys know that uh, after we're done working with Andrew and really polishing up um, the work that we're doing for him, um, we intend to tackle the conviction voting. Uh, that was a that was done, I believe, between uh, Block Science and OneHive. Um, uh, I might be missing people there. Else, Aragon. I think I'm not sure everyone's involved, but um, you know, you've mentioned Jeff. Uh, so we're, I'm working with him. We're going to create a smart paper off of the conviction voting, um, update some of the documentation there, and really create a nice interactive um, presentation of that. Because Jeff was saying there's still a lot of interest around conviction voting. It gets a lot of visits, and we think that that might be a great way to, you know, again prove out the idea of smart papers, because if you go to that, uh, that GitHub, um, you'll see that there's already a lot of um, you know, graphics and, and information there that they've already done a great job putting it all together. Uh, it just need, it could have one extra piece, which is some more interactive models uh, to help understand how it all works. For sure, yeah, and I realize that we're hitting time, so I just wanna 
thank you and Andrew again for joining us today and for both providing a presentation and kind of giving an overview of uh, loss functions and showing off the smart papers and, and what y'all are working on. So yeah, thank you to, to both of you for spending the time with us and thank you to uh, those in that community who joined and were part of the discussion. So yeah, we'll get kind of a summary of this up on our forum uh, and yeah, we'll follow up to, to kind of have some more discussions and see where else we can collaborate as well there. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. And Eugene, yes, I'll share you links so that you can share those as well to some of the smart papers. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.